Peter, thanks for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, I've seen a lot of very exciting work here at the University of Maryland. It's been just a tremendous opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the work of principally two of my graduate students and a postdoc, uh, Elia Alern and Anandram Venkata Subaramanian, uh, and the postdoc, Jin Wan Li, who's now at uh, Intel. Uh, this work on microcantilevers was actually originated several years ago by another, another graduate student. Uh, with a collaboration with, uh, with Thomas Thundat at Oak Ridge National Labs. And uh, the, current, the current work is with uh, collaboration with Sandia, in particular Mark Allendorf, Vitaly Stavila, and Alex uh, Robinson. So our objective is to make a, a low power, portable a sensing system for volatile organic compounds. And we want to emulate the exquisite sensitivity that you find in nature and in olfaction. Uh, one of the most widely used chemical analysis systems today is gas chromatography with perhaps with mass spec or other type of uh, uh, chemical analysis with the column. And so what we want to do is make a portable system using microcantilevers where we could functionalize the microcantilevers to have specific separation uh, properties. Uh, in other words, make really like a poor man's uh, GC system. Uh, we like to explore different applications, both for monitoring air quality, uh, uh, maybe in, in a building, for example, or uh, in, in the environment, in addition to other applications for detecting volatile compounds, looking at uh, medical health for breath analysis, and uh, food safety, looking for odors generated by bacteria or fungi, which could indicate you know, the, the quality uh, condition of uh, food. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in, in, in these kinds of uh, uh, detection systems. And the group at Sandia have made a portable GC system, which includes a microfabricated column and surface acoustic wave type detectors integrated in a handheld instrument, as you can see uh, in this uh, picture. So these are the topics I'm going to cover. Uh, what, we, what we've been taking advantage of with the microcantilever transducers, which are exquisitely sensitive uh, stress-based detection systems, is metal organic framework films. So a metal organic framework film is a nanoporous material that can be synthesized in a solution, and it can be uh, selected to have a particular pore size. It has very high surface area, like a zeolite compound. So there's a lot of interest in developing these materials for uh, catalysis and for energy storage uh, and for other uh, applications. Uh, but a few groups have begun to look at how they can be used for sensing. So I'll show you the principle of operation and the fabrication technique used micromachining to build the microcantilever sensors. And I have some examples to show you. And then I'll show you results for detection of uh, water vapor at uh, room temperature and some other volatile organic compounds. We re really tried to select a, a range of different materials, ketones, acetone, different um, uh, alcohols, uh, CO2, uh, uh, different uh, gases and volatile compounds that might be of interest in ver various applications. And then I'll show you briefly some modeling results where we've been looking at the mechanical stress induced in the cantilever and how to optimize the design to improve the performance and how the mechanical properties of the MOF itself can influence the detection. Please feel free to ask any questions during the presentation. I'm very happy to answer them. Uh, as, as questions come up. So metal organic frameworks uh, have received a lot of attention over the last five, ten years. The number of papers published has been increasing very dramatically. And basically, it's a, a crystalline uh, structure that can be formed in solution that comprises of, of, of a cation, which is precipitated with an organic linker to form a crystalline framework. Uh, so in the slide here, I indicate some different metal ions that might be selected, and then here's some of the linker, organic linkers that can then form the uh, uh, cubic uh, lattice. So this uh, early work from Yagi was one of the pioneers in the field where the yellow sphere uh, indicates the free, the open volume within inside the uh, framework. So um, what we're interested in though is taking advantage of the uh, absorption of analyte into the framework and its change in mechanical properties that we can detect uh, with the cantilever. 
So we focused mostly on a, uh, uh, a selecting MOFs that might have uh, use for chemical detection. And um, also, of course, it's important that they're st stable. Uh, in atmospheric conditions, once you remove the, s the growth solvent, uh, and they don't, you know, they don't um, degrade in the presence of water vapor. Uh, so you might select, for example, a nickel BP MOF that would have particular affinity for explosive compounds, or this uh, uh, zinc uh, iodine TP T MOF, which has an affinity for the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and then the so-called pizza MOF has an interesting name. <laughs> for uh, environmental uh, pollutants because of their uh, different uh, chemical affinity. Uh, we've worked mostly with the copper BTC, which is a copper MOF. The, the benzene uh, tricarboxylate is the linker molecule used in uh, forming the uh, cubic lattice. Uh, and it's also known as HKUST because it was discovered, the structure was discovered at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology a number of years ago. I think there's also a HKUST2 as well. <clears throat> so you can see that the, the uh, ion reacts with the, uh, with the carboxylate groups and the benzene ring to form this paddle wheel structure. So there's two ions and then the uh, linker molecules. And then you can assemble these paddle wheels into this cubic lattice. And when that takes place in solution, you have particular uh, pore volumes formed within the uh, framework. So there's two kinds of pore sizes which are important for applications of MOFs. One is the internal volume, which could indicate the level of uh, uh, concentration of material you can get into the framework. Uh, oh, hi, Ben. <laughs> How are you doing? And the other is the, the uh, pore limiting diameter that connects the different pores within the uh, framework. And so uh, showing in this diagram the uh, 13 angstrom, the largest pore, volume internally, and then the secondary uh, volume in the structure. But connecting uh, on the cubic lattice is a nine angstrom pore limiting size, which would then limit diffusion of molecules into, the, into and out of the framework. And then there's a side pocket, which has a 4.6 angstrom uh, window uh, connected with the other pores. So the uh, copper BTC uh, material uh, has some very interesting mechanical properties that when a water is absorbed or desorbed from the framework, it produces this conformational change in the structure. And you can get up to a 0.45% uh, shrinkage in the cell volume uh, when water is, is removed. It has a very high surface area uh, and it can absorb up to 40% by weight uh, into the framework. Other MOFs uh, of a, uh, show anomalous mechanical properties like MOF 508. This is a, uh, a, a cubic lattice also, uh, which, ha which is really consisting of two face center cubic lattice, which, which is, can be, uh, two, sorry, two cubic lattices which can be inter interposed. And when you remove the growth solvent, you see this, uh, this phase transformation uh, and a 10% uh, strain developed. So the microcantilever sensor will combine the semiconductor strain gauge with this nanoporous material for chemical detection. And so uh, together with Sandia National Labs, the postdoc at Sandia has been uh, synthesizing and uh, growing them off onto the cantilevers we fabricate in the microelectronics clean room. So this diagram shows you a cross section of one of the uh, sensors. Uh, you can see there's a single crystal silicon uh, strain gauge. It's N-type, which we find has a higher a gauge factor than the P-type for this stress-based detection. Unlike uh, AFM probes, the, tip, the piezoresistive AM, AFM probes are typically P-type doped to give you higher sensitivity. But because we're looking at the uh, bending-induced uh, stress distribution, you can think of the surface of the cantilever uh, being uh, acted upon by the by the by the uh, by the MOF, which is mechanically coupled to the surface, like you would inflate a balloon. So you have a stress distribution, both transverse and longitudinally, across the beam. So it's different than an AFM probe, where you just have a, a tip-loading uh, situation. 
We use uh, uh, silicon dioxide for the structural material in the cantilever, and then the strain gauge is offset from the neutral axis. Um, we would like to have a high uh, sensitivity to bending, so the cantilevers are typically one micron or less in, uh, in thickness, and we want to select the, the orientation of the uh, a, a dope, a doping of the cantilever to achieve the highest possible sensitivity or low, you know, lowest detectable uh, stress level. So for those of you who are involved in microfabrication, you've seen these very confusing slides before where a little simple cross-section picture shows you, you know, weeks of work in the clean room. But uh, for those who haven't, I apologize. But basically, uh, this shows the silicon on insulator uh, structure. So we use uh, RIE and lithography to etch through the single crystal silicon to define the strain gauge, and then a gold titanium for the ohmic contact to the silicon. This is covered with a silicon nitride layer for passivation by PECVD. And then we flip to working on the back side of the wafer. So these are a double side polished wafers. We can um, uh, deposit a layer of aluminum, which will be later used for the uh, 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 layout of the cantilever profile passivate with silicon nitride, and then etch from the back with deep RIE etching with the Bosch process, uh, stop on the silicon oxide, and coat with a layer of silicon nitride for stress compensation in the beam, because the silicon dioxide layer is very highly stressed in, in a buried uh, oxide type um, a substrate. So the silicon nitride is for stress compensation, and then finally uh, etch through from the front to release the cantilever. I guess if you want more information, I can give you the references on the details of the fabrication process. But one of the issues we had to deal with in building these very low spring constant uh, beams is the stress balance in the structure. As you can see, our early attempts, we have really quite a tight radius of curvature uh, on the uh, cantilever. And so the silicon nitride on the back of the beam would then provide a compensation for the buried oxide stress to produce flat beams. And then the wide cantilevers, we've added also stress compensation films. So using plasma-based uh, growth, you can adjust the stress compressive tensile in the uh, material. And this is some of the data my student was putting together on several different plasma systems, the STS, UniAxis, and Oxford uh, system. And in the end, he selected the, the uh, STS PCV2 D system where you can adjust the nitrous oxide to the silane ratio to adjust the compressive film stress uh, and it also has an impact on the film deposition rate. So we need to define both the thickness and stress level in the film to get uh, minimize the radius of curvature uh, in, the, uh, in the beam. And I can give you more details if you're interested in that uh, aspect of the uh, design. So to deposit the MOF, we use a layer-by-layer layer growth. This work was carried out at Sandia National Labs, and uh, it's following on from the work of, of Zacher in, in Germany, where he used uh, two growth solutions and a rinse step. The, um, uh, the, the iron um, in solution is seeded onto a hydroxylated uh, oxide surface, or we've also used a self-assembled monolayer on gold to get the right conditions for nucleation. Um, and then after a rinse, you can add the, uh, the organic uh, linker molecule and then build up layer by layer the uh, structure of the uh, MOF on the surface. So this is really important to get good mechanical coupling between the MOF and the surface of the cantilever for the stress uh, sensing. Then you have a rinse, and I have forgotten what the rinse is, maybe something like methanol to rinse off the reactants, and then you add the carboxylate, benzene carboxylate in solution, allow it to react, and then rinse again, and then you add the uh, metal ion and uh, build up layer by layer like a self-assembly process. It doesn't come out quite as good as an ALD. Uh, so uh, at Sandia, they actually have a QCM in the growth chamber so they can measure the mass uptake 
so they can see when the uh, layer has, uh, uh, I guess, satur reached saturation before you go to the next, you know, the rinse and then the next growth uh, step. They published some papers. This paper here describes, uh, Vitaly's work describes some of these these improvements to get better control of the layer. So to, to grow 100 nanometers, it may take you know, uh, uh, 30, 40 cycles of uh, growth. So we have some characterization of the MOF material using XRD and compare the uh, grazing in incidence XRD on a coupon samples in the growth chamber against the um, uh, powder um, MOF crystals. So if we, if we see a good agreement in the XRD measurements, then that means we've formed you know, the structure we were hoping for on the surface. And then these are some AFM and SEM images that show, uh, show the, uh, the MOF crystals formed on, on the surface of a, of a, a substrate. No. Yeah, you can also form larger crystals uh, in, in the growth solution. We've grown up to like one micron size crystals. And then those are actually useful because you can do nano indentation on large crystals and measure the uh, modulus of, of the MOF. <clears throat> so this shows you some images of the micro cantilever. It's 230 micron in length, 80 micron wide, silica. A beam, so you can see it's transparent with the semiconductor strain gauge and contacts. And then these are optical and SEM images where we can see the MOF has deposited on the surface of the uh, cantilever. Uh, it's not uh, perfectly uniform, but it looks like all of the beam is coated with MOF. There's some thickness variation. And then finally, this shows the cross section showing the, the uh, strain gauge uh, and structural layers and stress compensation. Uh, film and I have a chip that shows well a little bit hard to see but if you have very good eyesight you might see some of the cantilevers at the other end of the chip from the contact pads so we do resistance measurements to make sure the strain gauges are uh, connected and then we've tried to do some frequency measurements with with the, with the objective of measuring how much moth is actually grown on the cantilevers. If we measure the frequency before growth and after growth, we should be able to get an idea of the average thickness uh, of the moth. We have, we've had some problems with this, uh, these measurements, but this, we, this was something that we were, we get quite a lot of scatter in the data. So uh, I'm not gonna present that because it doesn't quite agree with my uh, estimate, uh, but here. But with each cantilever we can inspect to make sure we have a coating uh, and uh, before we do the um, chemical exposure. During the gas flow measurements, we're going to introduce different uh, organic, volatile organic compounds at room temperature, typically, or slightly elevated temperatures. And we have um, uh, opportunity to introduce a different test gas or the carrier gas nitrogen uh, as a dilutant and then bubble through uh, water or the volatile um, organic compound here with uh, some uh, temperature control of this chamber. And then we have the test cell where we've wire bonded the sensors into the, uh, into the uh, flow cell. So we actually have two chips here so we can measure multiple um, cantilevers or, or you know, two dye with you know, different MOF coatings on the two chips at the same time if we want to. So the data acquisition system uses a Wheatstone bridge to measure the change in resistance of the strain gauge and a lock-in amplifier to give us better resolution of the resistance changes, which uh, I think the resolution is something of the order of 10 uh, milliohms. We typically use a two kilohertz uh, frequency and uh, drive it at um, uh, several hundred millivolts. And so the Wheatstone bridge allows us then to measure the uh, changes in resistance relative to reference resistors. And here, this, these two uh, boxes indicate uh, cantilevers, which are then uh, MOF uh, coded. And the student has written a LabVIEW program to allow us to uh, collect that data and store it uh, on the computer during the uh, experiment. So here's the response to a water vapor. This shows the differential voltage as a function of time. 
and here are different levels of uh, uh, water vapor uh, present in the flow. You can see there's a, uh, a reproducible uh, response here uh, where the uh, am amplitude is a function of the water vapor concentration and we have some, uh, some time constant uh, where the absorption looks a little bit more rapid than the desorption uh, cycle uh, for uh, water vapor. We get, we get at the, the most sensitivity for exposure to water vapor into, into the uh, film. So, so if we it is slow. I think it takes time for the analyte to diffuse into the, into the morph. And then you've got bumps? Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, this shows the differential voltage plotted against concentration for the uh, water vapor. Uh, and we've uh, changed the um, mass flow controller so we can cover different uh, dilution ranges. Uh, and we can fit this to a Langmuir type absorption isotherm so that um, the, uh, it looks like, it, like a single uh, site type absorption into the, into, the, uh, into the framework. And if we compare the response to a commercial humidity sensor. Um, the micro cantilever shows uh, shows a similar uh, behavior. I apologize. I probably should have, you know, replotted this in terms of ppm and the actual readings from the humidity uh, sensor to 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 get 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 them on the same um, scale. But one, one set of data actually is actually inverted from the other uh, the, the other set. <clears throat> we also have worked with lower concentration testing where we've in increased the flow rate of the uh, uh, diluting nitrogen gas and so we're able to detect down to very low concentrations of water vapor. This is with actually a thinner uh, cantilever uh, design uh, with, uh, but again with a copper BTC uh, coating. And uh, based on these measurements and the noise level in the data acquisition system, we think the detection limit is the order of 1 ppm. But what's interesting about this humidity sensor is that it has a very, very wide dynamic range uh, and excellent uh, stability. We've tested these sensors over uh, a year, over 20 months. We've been working with this cantilevers tested individual sensors over 12 months. We see a reproducible uh, response to water vapor. Uh, here are some of the um, numbers fit to the Langmuir type absorption curve, the capacity and the um, Langmuir absorption constant. Now, it would be interesting also to go one step further and measure these absorption characteristics as a function of temperature because we could extract then uh, an activation energy and it would uh, perhaps give us some, some better indication of the uh, the absorption sites within the framework which are responsible, which, which other, other people have measured absorption uh, into, into copper BTC and suggests that the copper sites are the ones which are the polar sites where the water is being uh, absorbed. Uh, as I mentioned, we've done these measurements over a period of 12 months and we see very uh, reproducible and reversible uh, response. And I think one of the reasons for this behavior is we don't have, a, uh, we have a, a, um, a reversible process within the framework and we're measuring the mechanical response due to absorption of analyte rather than uh, other ki kinds of chemical sensors where you may be looking for some electrochemical, uh, you know, redox reaction or some surface, uh, you know, uh, uh, absorption into, into a, into a polymer, we get because we're looking at a mechanical response, we get a very reproducible behavior. Do you need to store them in a special way, or are they just in the lab? They're, they're in the lab. At uh, the uncoated sensors, we keep in a dry box. But once we're working with them, we we have them in the in the lab, in the test cell, or in the regular lab ambient. So let's move on to some of the other volatile organic compounds of interest. Uh, this shows some data for water. We have a reversible response, different uh, concentrations, 
and a fairly, um, I guess, a, a slower desorption and absorption rate. Here's methanol. Also, we, we see similar behavior, except with methanol, the, um, the magnitude of the response is reduced compared to water. That's a good question. We, we do see an initial offset after purging with dry nitrogen for three or four hours uh, at an elevated temperature. And then we bring it back down to room temperature or 30 degrees, depending on which experiment we're looking at. Um, uh, and then there is an, the f very first pulse of uh, analyte. There's an offset, yes. Uh, this shows the, uh, the uh, absorption behavior for the uh, water, methanol, ethanol. Um, here we see uh, fitting a Langmuir type uh, curve, the absorption capacity and uh, uh, Langmuir constant. Uh, so we can also calculate a Henry's constant for the initial slope here, indicating the affinity uh, of the MOF material for the first uh, exposure to, uh, to uh, analyte. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I answered your question incorrectly on the last slide. Uh, th this, is, this is like a, um, a thermal effect from when we first turn on the flow. We get, we get a slight, um, because the, the silicon strain gauge is also, uh, has a temperature coefficient of resistance. We see that when we first turn on the flow, we see a little, little jump. Sorry about that. I was <laughs> and, and then it settles down as the temperature equilibrates. Mm -hmm. uh, with isopropanol and ethanol, we see this gradual uh, shift in the baseline as you go through uh, cycling at different concentrations. But we can recover the baseline after heating in dry nitrogen the original um, uh, behavior of the sensor. And you also notice that the response time is, is uh, slower uh, uh, here for these uh, analytes. So the amplitude remains constant, just the baseline shift? With the, with the oh, uh, the... Or does it become saturated with ethanol and so the response... Less, less so than other compounds. The, the um, I see what you're saying. Uh, that's a good question because we have, we've done two kinds of experiments, this kind of random, well, not really random, but selected uh, concentration levels, but you see this baseline shift. And then we've also done experiments where we just step up the concentration, you know, from say 150, 300, 450, and then the baseline is kind of integrated with the data. But when you go back to the original dry nitrogen, there's an offset from the beginning to the end of the experiment. But you can plot those changes in um, increased absorption to give you a, a Langmuir behavior. But the, the, you know, the offset is kind of integrated. But here we're switching back to dry nitrogen. So clearly all of the isopropanol is not desorbed. So then when you do the second exposure, we already have some isopropanol absorbed in the MOF. Does that answer your question or will you? And then here we have response with acetone and chloroform. With acetone, we have a very slow response time. Chloroform, a rapid response, and then a slow uh, uh, desorption. Um, and again, there's some, some uh, irreversible behavior with these uh, analytes and the response, um, the magnitude of the stress induced is, is, is diminished. Toluene shows some, some very unusual behavior. We see this like a mechanical overshoot and then a recovery uh, and then a slow desorption. At low concentration, we get recovery of the baseline, but as you go to higher concentration, it becomes uh, irreversible. So it may be that because, because of the different absorption sites within the framework, we're getting these different mechanical relaxation effects. But further work needs to be done really to identify 
how much uh, you know of the analyte is absorbed within the film, and, and maybe to get some information about maybe from XPS where in the film the absorption is taking place. We've also tried, yeah. In between samples, is that nitrogen? Yes. So here we have exposure to toluene with a background of water. So we've started working now with mixtures, and you can see absorption of water, and then toluene, and then the toluene response is saturated, and then we go back to uh, nitrogen with water, and then we can recover back, but not to the original baseline, so there's a hysteresis because of the toluene exposure. But the sensor can respond to toluene in the, in the presence of water. And then we've done the reverse experiment where we have here a nitrogen flow and then we introduce first toluene. We see that mechanical relaxation and then uh, titrate the water concentration and we can get back to the, to the reversible behavior with water in the presence of some toluene. And then when we go back to the dry nitrogen, you see we still have uh, a shift in baseline from some re residual toluene within the, within the MOF. Perhaps, I guess you have to confirm that that is the uh, case. So some of these uh, characteristics might be uh, useful for uh, identifying different volatile organic compounds. Other compounds show irreversible response, like uh, decane, we see an initial absorption and then some strange behavior where then it becomes insensitive. However, with heating the cantilever up to 50, 60 degrees C, we can recover the original baseline and the decane is, is removed from the uh, sensor. So here's a summary trying to kind of overview the different analytes we've looked at here, going from water to the different alcohols and then toluene acetone chloroform. You can see that the strength of the response is the greatest for the water absorption. So remember, we're not looking at the mass uptake, we're looking at the chemically induced stress. So analyte has to absorb into the film and produce a change in the structure to be uh, detected. So we see some, um, we might compare this to the kinetic diameter of the different molecules. And you can see that as we increase the kinetic diameter, we see some changes in the uh, strength of the response. And then we have several analytes which show no response. So the decane carbon dioxide, which is certainly can diffuse into the MOF, but it produces no mechanical response. And then these other compounds here produce no uh, mechanical response. So the other thing to look at is how the uh, uh, absorption time constant is a function of the different uh, analytes and the uh, kinetic diameter. As we increase the kinetic diameter, going from water to, to uh, isopropanol and acetone, we see the absorption time becomes longer and longer for these, for these, uh, for these analytes at similar concentration levels. So maybe this is, a, this is an indication of the kind of the diffusion rate into the metal organic framework is, is, being, is having an influence on this uh, process. So some, some of these uh, characteristics may be used then to improve the chemical sensing, chemical selectivity. Um, we, we saw the, the diff very different response from decane ethanol. Uh, CO2 produces no response. So there's a molecular sieving based aspect. Uh, and then of course the energy of attraction, of interaction between the molecule and the binding regions within the pore. So we've been looking at data from copper BTC, but there are some other moths we've started to work with are not 100 and not 101, where we have a smaller pore size, but some very similar internal chemistry. And then the ZIF-7 and ZIF-8, which have a more of a tubular type of structure within the MOF, we have very small pore limiting diameters. Uh, and then the largest cavity diameter here can, can, uh, can, can also be varied. So we may expect to see some better, better chemical selectivity as we change this, these dimensions uh, with different types of uh, MOFs. Uh, so some, a summary of some of the work with the NOT 101. Uh, again, we see strong absorption and excellent reversibility with water. Uh, with the methanol, we see some uh, good reversibility. Uh, toluene, we see some reversibility. Acetone, 
was reversible. It's, it's, I guess that's a little bit different than the copper BTC. And then the chloroform hexane, we saw a pretty strong response, poor reversibility. And, and here's the data on the, the cavity diameter and the poor limiting diameter. Well, we, 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 I guess we're, you know, so that, uh, further work needs to be done because it doesn't, you know, exactly fit that kind of uh, model. That the, you know, this, because when a, when a moth is, of course, characterized, it's under uh, with the X-ray uh, crystallography. I think it's some of it. This work is done at, in ideal conditions or low temperature, 77 Kelvin. So, but at room temperature, of course, the crystal has some ability to to breathe, and the pore diameters may be be fluctuating with time. So now I'd like to just show you some, some of our um, kind of directions for the, for the new cantilever design to try and improve the sensitivity. And uh, we've used the COMSOL for mechanical modeling of the uh, stress distribution in the cantilever structure with the uh, MOF film on the surface. We've assumed uniform thickness here. And we have some mechanical property measurements from the MOF to put into our uh, model. And then the piezoresistive strain gauge. Uh, these are the um, uh, uh, stress coefficients here, the piezoresistive stress coefficients for the N and the P-type silicon. And here is the dimensions for the different uh, layers. So we can, uh, of course, put a, an axis of symmetry in this uh, device and then analyze the resistance changes uh, from the strain gauge as a function of different uh, properties or different dimensions. Here we've been looking at the uh, MOF thickness itself on the cantilever. And I should point out to simulate this uh, chemically induced stress, we just uh, assumed that there was a temperature change and we gave the MOF an artificial expansion coefficient. So it just expands with this temperature change. So it's like it's absorbing the analyte. Um, so that's how we came up with the resistance change here for different um, passivating films, aluminum, silicon nitride, silicon dioxide. So you see gold, the gold SAM and the silicon dioxide look like the better choices for the, for the layer between the MOF and the uh, piezoresistive strain gauge, although the other materials may be better in capsulants. They, they, um, because of the higher modulus, they decrease the mechanical um, sensitivity. And then we've looked at both N and P type dope silicon uh, 100 uh, axis for the end doped, and then we orient in the other axis to get the higher um, piezoresistive coefficient for the p-doped material. So that's why we use end doped uh, sensors. And then we've looked at the dimensions of the uh, beam here and the placement of the piezoresistive strain gauge. And we found that if we increase the width of the cantilever, we can, uh, we can generate more uh, stress in, in the center of the structure with this wider design, about three times more uh, sensitivity. So we've now built some devices which have a wider uh, structure. And we've looked at um, uh, repositioning of the strain gauge relative to the uh, MOF film on the surface in both the 110 and the 100 direction of the wafer uh, to look at how this has uh, an effect on the uh, resistance change generated by the, um, by the MOF expansion. Uh, and then we've also looked at the mechanical properties of the MOF. Uh, luckily, we've worked with HKUST, which turns out to be a good choice for this kind of transducer. If we look at the MOF 508, that has a higher uh, uh, chemically induced stress. But because of the low Young's modulus, the relative resistance change upon, um, for sensing would be greatly reduced uh, here. Uh, NDC 508, uh, I'm off some other ZIFs here. Maybe they're good candidates if we pick the ones with a higher modulus to give us a good, uh, uh, um, a good amount of bend, induced bending in the cantilever for uh, sensing. So the new sensor design, we have uh, five sensors, three or five sensors in the center of the die now. That's just to kind of improve the uh, reliability when we're handling the chips so we don't accidentally uh, break any of them. Um, 
and then they go into a package like this. Um, we've also integrated now on the way for the full bridge, so we have the compensation resistors are now on chip rather than off chip, and we have um, two strain gauges per beam to, to build into the uh, bridge circuit. Now, this is the fabrication process. We've uh, modified it slightly to grow a thermal oxide on top of the single crystal silicon layer. So we've decreased the thickness of the um, strain gauge. We thought this may um, have some benefit because we're lowering the uh, modulus uh, overall. Uh, and we can get some stress compensation between these two compressive films. Uh, but uh, I think we, we underestimated the stress in the, um, in the buried oxide layer, so we have to add a, a, an additional layer of silicon dioxide to get flat structures uh, in this design. Uh, we've been using backside etching to uh, release the cantilevers, and for those that you have done uh, STS, ICP, there's a lot of issues with the, you know, silicon grass forming and getting good uh, etch stop uh, uniformity across the uh, surface of the substrate. Here you can see some cantilevers extending from the edge of a, a die and predicting exactly this profile is quite challenging. However, we've been uh, lucky enough to work with a STS HRM machine and we're able to get a, a better uh, profile here, better vertical profile and um, uh, release these wider uh, cantilever structures. It also has, um, a, a, we've changed to a different a carrier wafer, uh, which can um, be cl cleaned up more easily than the, um, uh, using this crystal bond material. So we have uh, a bunch of dyes now which have been being electrically tested and some of them are, are being uh, coated with uh, MOF at Sandia. This one includes a reflecting a uh, mirror here, so we can use uh, AFM to look at the uh, vibration of the uh, structure. And the uh, student has worked very hard on this and produced quite a high yield, high mechanical yield of uh, released beams. And, um, but what we have some issues with here is sometimes the contact resistance is not very good on some of these uh, devices. So I've shown you some uh, n-type piezo-resistant microcantilever arrays, which we've coated with different MOFs and used for detection of volatile organic compounds. And I think you might agree this is a, an exciting area to explore for uh, chemical detection. It is a very low power uh, type of transducer. And um, you've seen some reversible behavior and also some non-reversible behavior although we can recover the baseline with um, the heating of the cantilever. Um, detection limits we've estimated are around the 100 ppm level with the ethanol, methanol, 1 ppm for water. Um, these uh, transducers are very robust and stable over a period of, of over a year. Uh, and we see the mechanical properties of the MOF are a key factor in designing good transducers and I uh, hope to have soon some more data with these wider cantilevers to show you improved uh, sensitivity. Uh, and what we would like to do is introduce different MOFs onto the cantilevers so we can have an array of different uh, signals available for interpreting components in a complex uh, mixture. We tried to select different kinds of compounds from uh, halogenated to hydrocarbon, aromatics, ketones, uh, polar, to an alcohols to get an idea of what kinds of mechanisms might be responsible for the, um, the uh, sensing. So the stress is, a, is an area that we, we need to uh, optimize and the quality of the nitride film uh, to get uh, good devices. Uh, we'd like to code different MOFs on different sensors uh, with any transducer, one aspect is increasing the signal from the transducer for your analyte detection, and the other aspect is lowering the noise in the measurement system. So if we could further improve the data acquisition, we could, of course, detect uh, at lower concentrations. 
uh, and we need to have control of the, you know, the environment, the temperature and vibration present. Uh, and it would be nice to have a quick way to screen moths before we go to the trouble of growing them actually onto cantilevers, so we could do some uh, uh, measurements in parallel. So I'd like to thank Sandia National Labs for the financial support for this project and the technical support in the uh, Institute for uh, a, 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 the Microelectronic Engineering and Nanotechnology. It used to be the Nanotechnology Research Center. They just changed the name. And the Clean Room staff and some collaborations with, uh, with Professor Jim Gole in physics and Oliver Brandt in uh, electrical engineering. But really, I'd like to really thank the graduate students who did all the hard work. Hard work. I just get the pleasure to come here and talk about their results. And uh, Elia Alern is the student who did the majority of these measurements and a part of the, the cantilever fabrication. And Anandram Venkatasat Rubian is, is the uh, other student who worked on this project. He wasn't at this dinner. This dinner was for Elia when he finished his, his master's thesis. Amber worked on, uh, she's finished her thesis as well. She worked on um, separation of uh, uh, salmonella, live and dead salmonella using um, chemotaxis. Uh, Drew Owen is a PhD student. He's working on uh, magnetic beads for capturing targets in a fluidic system looking for uh, capturing a salmonella and viruses. Milad Navai is working on a miniature gas chromatography system. And uh, Ali Mahadavai Far is working on um, a thermal conductivity gas sensor, uh, a nanowatt thermal conductivity gas sensor that could be introduced with a GC system, but also as a standalone sensor for uh, different uh, gases, uh, helium, hydrogen, CO2, methane. And thanks for your attention. Thank you.